So, um, welcome everyone to NeuroTalks today. Um, we, today we have a very special guest, is Dr. Adam Arthur. Uh, he's a neurosurgeon, he's professor at the University of Tunis, and um, he's going to talk about uh, endovascular treatment of chronic subdural hematoma. So, um, uh, this kind of pathology is very frequent. We know that it might increase in the future uh, with people getting older and people taking more anticoagulants and uh, antiplatelets um, medication. So we know that probably it's going to uh, increase in number. So having uh, another option for these patients is probably a, a, very, a very good idea. So uh, Dr. Adam Arthur, thank you so much for joining NeuroTalks. And um, I, I'm really uh, looking forward to hear what you have to tell us. Thanks so much. So I, f I have a few disclosures to make. Firstly, uh, some of this work is not my own. Uh, I've cited some of the figures in the slides, but David Fiorella, who's a brilliant interventional neuroradiologist in New York, has done some of this work. And also there's a, a very good group in Paris uh, with Nadar Saror, uh, and, and some of these slides come from their work. So I wanna make sure everyone gets credit. As far as disclosures, I'm going to talk about the STEM trial, and I am a, an investigator for the STEM trial for BALT. Can you see the screen okay, Tiago? Perfectly, yeah. Okay. So subdural blood uh, collections are very common, as uh, Tiago mentioned, um, and they often are mixed density. It's a major public health problem and a reversible and underrecognized cause of dementia. Um, as is the case for many things in medicine, the way we manage this is not very well studied. Uh, and associated with some failure rates, which I'm going to uh, go over. So we see between 13 and 17 cases per 100,000 people per year. Uh, and the prevalence of this disease is increasing. Uh, as Tiago mentioned, we have an aging population and we're using more anticoagulants. And so in my country, uh, there's a VA study that projects that we'll see up to 60,000 cases a year uh, by the year 2030. This is an excellent paper from Japan uh, from just two years ago, showing that as the population ages, uh, we're seeing an increased incidence of chronic subdural hemorrhages, uh, often in that older age group. So the traditional teaching on this has been that this is simply uh, the consequence of bleeding, but I think there may be more to it. Initially, there may be bleeding, but this stimulates inflammation within the subdural space, and then you have this thickening dural layer on the inside with capillaries that grow from the dura. And, and these capillaries do not have very good tight junctions and they tend to leak blood, which then uh, breaks down and creates a cycle. So this is a figure out of an excellent paper uh, from England uh, from 2017. And it shows this internal membrane uh, that has recruitment of uh, inflammatory cells through interleukins um, an increase in membrane proliferation, uh, and then uh, continued lysis of the clot, and, and a, a host of, of factors that increase the permeability of capillaries and cause more leakage. Our abnormal vessels that, that derive from the middle meningeal artery, almost exclusively, these do not come from the pia or from the internal carotid circulation. And there's even more evidence that show that in this chronic subdural, the middle meningeal artery enlarges. So this is a study from Japan from just four years ago that I think is very interesting, showing a statistically significant increase in the middle meningeal artery in these cases where the subdural is. So many of us have, have done angiograms on these cases and seen this abnormal cotton wool uh, blush within these subdural membranes. And you can even see contrast there on DynaCT images. So the question is, uh, is this actually a vascular pathology? Is this positive feedback cycle where you have leakage from these small little vessels, is this a vascular disease and therefore amenable to treatment? So if the problem is these leaky membranes that continue to leak at a rate that exceeds 
the ability of the body to absorb the blood, then is that something we could affect? So what do we do with these patients now? Well, you can observe them, but rarely are they able to solve this problem on their own. Uh, and there are various surgical management options. So I'm a surgeon by background. Uh, we can do a craniotomy and, and try to irrigate the blood out. You see that in a case of mine on the upper right. You can drill just holes and put drains in or irrigate, or there are bedside procedures. But sometimes the amount of fluid that continues to drain is significant uh, because again, this is an exudative process. So all of these procedures in elderly patients require cessation of anticoagulation medicine, ICU stays, general anesthetic. And so we do see high rates of recurrence. Uh, and we do see patients that have myocardial infarctions and strokes um, during their treatment for subdural. So is there a better way? We don't have good evidence for traditional management. We see in hospital mortality on the order of about 10%. And unfortunately, the 12-month mortality in this disease is about one in three patients. So it's been classified as a sentinel health event. Um, and here's just a, a, a meta-analysis that looks at randomized trials and observational studies showing fairly consistent uh, uh, high, high morbidity and mortality rates. Tiago, I'm just gonna stop here and make sure you're still hearing me, correct? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm gonna stop every now and again just to reassure me that you're still there. Yeah, so, I am again. Okay, um, so uh, is this a cerebrovascular disease that we can uh, strike at uh, through the middle meningeal artery? So the idea would be that we reduce or eliminate that continued microhemorrhage and break this cycle. Uh, and if we break the cycle, then we allow the body to resorb and heal. So the best paper I think in the literature so far is this paper by Ban et al. in radiology, where they did 72 patients with the, the polyvinyl alcohol, PVA. The majority of them is a preoperative adjunct to drainage, but some is sole treatment. And they did a good job of comparing this against a historical control group. And what they showed was that at six months, uh, they had very highly statistically significant positive results with embolization over conservative management. Um, but I am going to make the argument that this is a good disease for liquid embolics. Uh, DMSO-based embolics, obviously, you know, we're, we're going to use squid in the trial that I'm working on because we want to get into the microcapillary bed very distally. Um, and PVA requires flow, uh, and, and you're often in a wedge position. So this is an angiogram of a distal middle cerebral artery that you can see the abnormal subdural space there. You can see the, the capillary bed, you can see the staining. And then here's the same case with injection of a DMSO-based liquid embolic. So my argument to you is that I like the fact that I can see the pathology, I can see the growth in occlusion of the collaterals and the direct blockage of the subdural bed. It may be possible to do this with PVA. It may be possible to do this with um, cyanoacrylate, NBCA, or, or other, uh, uh, other uh, products. But this is, I think, a, a good way of doing it. Uh, the embolisate is visible. Uh, you can avoid dangerous anastomoses, and you can document the effectiveness of your embolization. Uh, whereas with PVA, often you're seeing a contrast, but you can't see the PVA. Uh, the procedures are fast and the embolization is permanent. Uh, this is safe. Often in the operating room, we will block the middle meningeal artery with bipolar and scissors. Uh, and this uh, is not something that has a great morbidity or mortality. So here's a, a case that I did very early on. It's an elderly gentleman with a symptomatic subdural. And within three months, he has a complete radiographic resolution and change in his shift. Here's a more uh, acute appearing, iso-dense to brain subdural with significant shift in a patient who is having difficulty walking and pronator drift. And here at four months, you see uh, significant improvement. Here's another example. This was one of the first cases I did. You can see the effacement of the right lateral ventricle. And this result is actually in only three weeks. This patient had an improvement in their uh, symptoms within general anesthesia. Um, it's a good question. 
The DMSO and the navigation of the middle meningeal artery is painful. So if at all possible, I recommend that this procedure be done under general anesthetic. I had a little old lady who was very angry at me because I did it uh, under conscious sedation and it hurt. But I have done this under conscious sedation. When I do it under conscious sedation, I give uh, both verapamil and lidocaine, cardiac lidocaine, into the middle meningeal artery prior to injecting DMSO. But um, I think the navigation of the middle meningeal artery is often a little difficult and you should not take it lightly. And so I like general anesthetic and a very good roadmap because if you mess around with the middle meningeal artery at the foramen spinosum for too long, it will spasm and then you will not be able to get distal. And I like being very distal out over the convexity. Okay, right. meanwhile, if I can uh, just ask, because you are talking about it. Um, so are you embolizing uh, the anterior and posterior branches or just one of them? It depends on whether it's a good day or a bad day. Today okay. I'm having a bad day. There's an electrical storm and my talk is ruined, but uh, on a good day, I can go out one branch and get a good embolization that actually goes through the collaterals and gets the entire territory of the subdural with one injection. Okay. But on a bad day, I have to do them separately. Okay. So there's, these are some slides from Dave uh, Fiorella to go over this a little bit, some of the questions that we've been talking about. So for anesthesia, we both prefer general anesthesia. Um, for access, I've been doing these either radial or femoral on the basis of the CTA. Um, sometimes the, the arch is very bad, and so my preference is radial. But if it's going to be a difficult case, difficult arch, I have no trouble just going femoral. Um, and then microcatheter, I've been mostly using the duo or the echelon. Um, in cases where I cannot get distal, uh, I cannot get around a bend, I will use the scepter XC. Okay. So I always do careful angiography. You, you must know where the blood supply is to the ophthalmic artery. You must look for the displacement of the capillary phase by the chronic subdural, and then a selective external carotid run to document the anatomy before you go in. So here's a, a good case where you can see um, that there is a, a branch there that you have to get beyond, and we're going to want to get very, very distal, right? So ideally for this subdural, you want to be all the way out there. Uh, and you may uh, get these territories as well through an injection here by getting the collaterals. You probably don't want to inject this lower branch because of the potential for collaterals that go into the skull base and get to the cranial nerves. So here's a super selective angio. This is the kind of case that, that we like to do. Um, and as I said, if you're not going to use general anesthetic, I do recommend the use of a little bit of verapamil and cardiac preservative-free lidocaine but the patient is still going to hurt. It's, it's, the lidocaine is not perfect. So I uh, have um, a very short attention span. I'm a surgeon. I'm not very patient. And so I just inject. I don't plug and push. I get a wedge position, and I enjoy just injecting and filling it out, and then do another branch if you need be. So I uh, then carefully look at it always post-injection uh, with selective angiography and DynaCT. So here's just some virtual cases. This is a symptomatic bilateral chronic subdural. Uh, here again, you can see the STA, you can see the middle meningeal artery. Um, you can see the branches there, the two main divisions, very small artery. And here's after you go out, this is a good day. This is easy. The uh, turn in the artery at foramen spinosum here is only a right angle. So this is, a, 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 this is when your God is smiling on you and making your life easy. So here's uh, the injection of the liquid embolic. And you can see again, the collateralization. So here, I don't need to do that other branch, right, Tiago? Because it's uh, refluxing and getting that very nicely. And that's where you have to be careful that it doesn't reflux too far. Uh, Post-op injection. Um, and then uh, if you need to, you can go in another branch. Yeah. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. Another case. I'm going to, I'm going to press on a 65 year old gentleman on a direct thrombin inhibitor with left weak, uh, left weak side of weakness and hemianopsia. Uh, here you can see the shift, the mass effect. 
this patient has left sided weakness in hemianopsia because he has a P1 stroke. <laughs> yeah. So you always have to look. So in this case, we're doing a thrombectomy. Uh, and then after the thrombectomy, we're going to treat the subdural. Oh, very good. <laughs> so again, this is a good day. It's an easy bend. Yeah. Sometimes it's very hard. This is not. But you can see very, very distal. Yeah. This is what I prefer. It's very safe and very effective. There's your angio run. And then here's the injection of the liquid embolic. You see the abnormal. You do see here some collaterals going into the scalp. Sometimes you even see some fistula, uh, meningomeningeal fistula. That's okay. Also very safe out far. Here I wonder if there's a little fistula there in the middle, right? That's probably vein filling, but that's okay. So in this case, we had to and the presentation much more, but um, just a, a couple of questions. Uh, someone was asking, uh, actually Dave Ferreira, he was asking if the materials we have are enough, are good enough to go very distally. I think I already said yes, but um, what about Apollo and Sonic? Do you think they, are they important in this situation? Or th it's almost never a problem to, get back the, the catheter to withdraw it. I have not seen it be a problem ever. I mean, you're not dealing yeah. with uh, significant tortuosity. Um, uh, it's really a, a straight vessel. So no, I don't think Apollo or Sonic is necessary. Yeah, and, and regarding, um, I, I've seen that you have embolized um, some kind of not that chronic hematomas. Um, so when, when do you decide uh, if just they are symptomatic, uh, uh, maybe even if they are just subacute uh, hematomas, you do it anyway. Or when do you decide to start uh, embolizing um, the arteries? Well, yeah. sorry. Yes, that's okay. So I wonder if I stop my camera, if that'll save bandwidth, as you say. So. Um, I think it's important to discuss this. An acute or, or very symptomatic subdural really should be drained as soon as possible. So I, I don't... Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can, yeah. So patients that are severely symptomatic really need surgical drainage. Um, in, in our trial, within the STEM trial, we're going to do patients who have chronic or mixed subdural, so they have to be isodense to brain on CT or hypodense. Okay. If the uh, subdural is hyperdense to brain, then they're not eligible for the trial. Okay, okay, that's, that's uh, something that can guide us. Um, and, and regarding, um, uh, well, I think you have almost uh, asked all, all my questions. Uh, the, uh, someone is asking here. Someone was asking if you were calling Trump. <laughs> yeah, I should call him and see if he can help. Listen, guys, I'm so embarrassed. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, no, I'm, it's okay. I'm at the hospital and there's uh, you know, a lot of okay. problems. You know, I'm in well, the third world. It's not a beautiful place like Portugal. <laughs> well, Adam, thank you so much. I think we don't need to, to take more time. Uh, I know that you have uh, many more cases and it's very early in the morning still in the, in the US. So um, thank you so much for your time. Um, and um, let me just uh, let our colleagues know that uh, next week we have a uh, a very, a very interesting question, um, a very interesting um, neuro talks uh, uh, with the results of the, this recently published uh, paper on New England Journal of Medicine about uh, doing uh, uh, RTPA before thrombectomy. So um, Professor Young is going to be with us uh, next week. So I invite everyone to join. So if you want to be uh, kept um, with all the next uh, talks, just follow the Instagram account, Interventional Neurobiology, 
uh, and uh, everything will be uh, posted there. So Adam, thank you so much for joining. And, uh, and uh, I, I hope we can, we can meet another time with better connection. Me too. I apologize, um, but I'm happy to come back. I can, I can maybe do it uh, from home where I have better internet well, uh, in the next few weeks, if you like. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure we will have the opportunity for, uh, for, for that. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank